Hi, this is Zara Fuzzle, the voice of Halo, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello team, and welcome to Scream Something, Volume 10. My name is Emily, and I'm here with my co-host, Producer Neil. Hey everybody, in Scream Something, Emily and I will be sharing our initial thoughts and reactions for the episodes of Season 4 that were released last Saturday. There will be plenty of Aster in these episodes, but our team will be saving our deeper analysis for full episode breakdowns we have planned for after the season finale. So, today is the day? It is. It's just making last minute preparations. And with that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The titles for this week's episodes are Inhospitable and Needful. The release date was October 16th, 2021. The in-episode dates are February 25th of Team Year 9, and then February 25th, one year later, and then March 22nd through 23rd. The directors were Christopher Berkeley and Vinton Huke, and the writers were Greg Weissman and Andrew Blanchett, who is new to the show. Just in time for your next mission. We start this season with a scene from the very end of season three with Connor and McGann reaffirming their engagement, and then we cut to one year later where they're boarding the bioship with Beast Boy and Martian Manhunter to travel to Mars for the first of two scheduled Super Martian weddings. And yes, I am already a wreck and everything is fine. A month later, the whole group arrives on Mars and meets up with McGann's sister, Emery, and things are clearly a bit tense among the Moors sisters. It's fine. (laughs) Connor, McGann, and Garfield take a walk through the city on their way to their next stop of this trip and witness firsthand the increased hostility towards both white Martians and Earthlings on Mars. Meanwhile, John and Emery work on setting up Mars's new Zeta tube to Earth, though not everyone is excited about this new development. After arriving at McGann's parents' house, Superboy, Miss Martian, and Beast Boy are confronted by a group of racist green Martians who want them off-planet. And Ja'an and Ma'at inform the group that tensions between Martian castes have escalated ever since the mysterious murder of progressive ruler King Saturn last month. Meanwhile, somewhere else on Mars, McGann's brother, Macomb, oh, this one, gathers and encourages a group of white Martian extremists. Nearing the end of the episode, we have a thousand Martians trying to convince the Queen of Mars that the Zeta Tube and any contact with Earth, for that matter, is a bad idea. But once she and Martian Manhunter convince them to allow the plan to go forward, and everything seems to be okay, which it's not <laughs> very soon, Ja'on enters the Zeta Tube only for it to explode unexpectedly and for us to see a mysterious figure sitting in a weird sphere. Which we will get no information about ever, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, praise the young justice gods, because minutes later... Episode 2 picks up in the literal wreckage of the previous episode as everyone rushes to figure out who sabotaged the Zeta Tube and what happened to Martian Manhunter. McCalm is arrested for being suspicious in the vicinity of the explosion and McGann and her parents go with him, while Superboy and Garfield stay behind to help with the detective work. Emery is able to get in contact with the Watchtower and confirm that Ja'an successfully arrived before the explosion and all of us breathe a sigh of relief. But uh, during the call, the Mars-Earth communication satellite is destroyed, cutting off any chance of Ja'an returning to Mars in any sort of quick fashion. McGann has an emotional conversation with McCom while he's imprisoned and establishes that McCom had nothing to do with the satellite explosion and didn't personally blow up the Zeta tube either. Meanwhile, Prince Jem enlists the help of Connor and Garfield in trying to figure out who might have killed his father as the death of the king may be related to the Zeta tube sabotage. 
Later that day, we have McGann and Connor's Ma'ayava'ana ceremony, that, and that's, uh, that's Martian for make Emily's heart explode, uh, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Text Emily, you are broken now. Send all of the, are you okay, texts. Yes. But while the two of them are being happy and in love, post-Sacred River ceremony, a rock slide happens and it nearly kills them. Um, which made me think very much of role-playing games, rock falls. <laughs> Rocks fall, everyone, everyone dies. dies. Yep. <laughs> and just out of sight of our heroes, three teens, Saturn Girl, Phantom Girl, and Chameleon Boy, discuss a mysterious he who seems to be planning something nefarious and who apparently caused the rocks to fall. Finally, Macom meets with Desaad to collect his reward for his work on New Genesis last season, a gene bomb from Apocalypse that will kill all red and green Martians in two days' time. And that's not ominous at all. So, that's these two episodes, and we haven't even covered everything that's in these two episodes, because I had to condense this down into just, just the key bits Yep. So I had to keep telling myself, don't care. Don't just tell yourself you don't care. No, never. Very difficult. Very difficult. Uh, so with that in mind, let's let's move on to some Aster. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. So starting from the beginning with these episodes, uh, the new intro honestly just made me tear up. I... It's so good. It's so well put together. I love the music this season. I love that we have a full intro sequence again after last season had just kind of the like low, like low key, very threatening, like one chord, which was great for that season's vibe. But I'm glad we are back to having this epic superhero opening that fills my heart with joy and makes me cry because we're seeing these characters again. It's so good. It, f- it felt like coming back to my favorite things about this show, and I loved that. The bigger thing that I saw, that, and it's so small, and I think that's kind of like my mode for sure, is the stutter step between what their designations were and what their designations are. Oh, I like it. I don't know why that piece was just like, that was the best. I loved it. I loved that little detail that like I hadn't noticed until a couple of people into the intro. I was like, oh, they're switching the designations, and they have – all the clips from the previous seasons and they all have a logo in the background and rewatching it today to catch something to finish writing up my notes. Like the very, very start of this, of the intro has like seven like arrow pointers all coming together for like the seven characters before it like explodes out into the intro. And that just looks really cool. Oh, yep. It's good. It's good. I just want the that final frame, and I'll throw in the key art. I want all of those for every device I own, <laughs> like officially, like I like, like high res official desktop, mobile, iPad, like yes. high res official wallpapers of those yes. shots of each mm-hmm. of the characters because they do they look exactly like that, and I want it. I want it so bad. I agree with you. Like this, as soon as you said that to me, I was like. Yes, I need this <laughs> on every device. I need to be able to open my computer and just see that like awesome Young Justice computer style overlay with my favorite characters. Yes, please. <laughs> so we we gotta we're gonna rip the band aid right off. Oh, I get to, I get to just start screaming. Yes. Okay. Uh, t- two weddings. I get two weddings. I get two weddings. We all get two weddings. This is not just for me. I just shrieked about it because I am I am on record as saying the one thing I really wanted out of a season four was a super Martian wedding. And it looks like we're getting the one thing I wanted twice. Uh, and I will absolutely weep at both. Also, we got a bonus soulmate bonding ceremony on a river that was just adorable and lovely uh, and that I had to struggle to learn how to pronounce. But it's wonderful. I am overjoyed. All of the people in our group who uh, texted or messaged me being like, hey, you okay?" I'm like, I am fine. (laughs) I am wonderfully fine and I will continue to be a shrieking ball of emotion all season, and that is true facts of, about about me. 
it like we cashed in on it so quickly too. Like it's not like because normally you see the weddings like historically like the finale or like season be it season or series um like that's kind of the go-to like so and so like there's always been this tension and now they're going to get married but it's like no no no. we've talked about it and here's part of it all but immediate yes and it'll just and it just it's good it's it's gonna be well it's gonna be fine it's not things are sure to happen there will be chaos there i don't think it's i don't think it's an accident that you know mcgann and connor's wedding is in three days and uh the gene bomb meant to explode and destroy all of mars is in two days uh and we have to stop that for several reasons one of them high on the list is there is a Martian Kryptonian wedding that needs to happen. The saving the whole planet is also slightly higher on the list, but... Yeah. So I am overjoyed by that. And to rapid fire do some little things about that, about this entire concept that make me very happy. I am overjoyed by the concept of two weddings. I love their setup for why. I love... We're going to go more into Martian world building in a bit, but like, I love that this is set up as like a traditional religious ceremony for Mars that McGann's parents want to be able to attend. And that's lovely. And one of the things that struck me with this that I'm not going to go into a whole super sweethearts about it, but I loved that the show is portraying Connor specifically as clearly being happy and excited to get married. Because a lot of shows lean into kind of these old, not great cliches of like, women are excited to get married and men deal with it and just kind of play along for the sake of their relationships or whatever. And I'm like, that's not, that's not great. And so it's really nice to see that like, McGann is happy and Connor is also extremely happy. He is happy that McGann is happy and he is also clearly like excited and invested in these things happening. Like the religious ceremony is for her and her family, but like, he's clearly like, I can't wait for us to get back to earth and have the other ceremony that all of our friends are going to be able to attend. Like, and that's just really nice to see. And I liked that. I keep thinking in my head, like probably the most, like if we're going to get this civil ceremony and everyone in attendance by far and away, this is going to be the most paused and repeated scene in all of young justice. Cause people are going to be picking out every single character and trying to place them um, and come up with their, their name and their backstory and their designation and everything in between. Um, the other thing to like go into that point is like his enthusiasm isn't curbed by the absolute mess that is everything surrounding it. Like it's not even like there's no hesitation on his part in spite of those things. I was thinking that too about how like it's also such a trope in like superhero fiction of a wedding or whatever other normal life event is postponed or messed up by superhero things happening. And I like that this show is acknowledging that like These two people have been balancing these parts of their lives for 10 years. This is not a new thing. They're like, we came to Mars to get married. We're going to get married. We will also put all of the other stuff that isn't even really our job. And at this point is not a immediate threat. (laughs) We will put that on a list and we will deal with it. But we are also making time for the reason we came here. And that is nice to see because it makes sense to me for these two characters. Like that just, I'm like, yeah, that tracks. That makes perfect sense for what you have set up here. And it's cool. I like it. Uh, No one is surprised, but I like that these two characters are getting married and being happy about it. It's wild. Tell me more. No. (laughs) To, To lead into some talk of Martian world building, which was one of the other things in this, these two episodes that made me so happy and so because it's so fun and it's so interesting my transition thought here is i think it is fascinating to me that when setting up the the ceremony on the river the maayava ana ceremony i can say it i can say it more than once in an episode mm-hmm. uh they point out that like mcgann talks about how she knew that her parents had to really struggle to be able to get married and had to find someone who was literally so old he did not fear the consequences of performing a cross-caste system marriage. And 
Emery in that scene, McGann's sister, has this moment where she says quietly to herself, oh, I didn't know that. And I think that's such an interesting little moment because to me, I feel like it's setting up one, some character development for Emery, but also this idea that she and possibly McGann's other green siblings have no concept of how difficult it was for McGann or for white Martians in general to live and exist in this society. And like, I'm not going to give them a full free pass on that, but like the idea that they didn't know this thing that clearly to McGann is something so essential to understanding her parents' relationship that she is just fully unaware of is a fascinating bit of making that character and that the way she fits into this world makes sense to me. And as an only child, everything that comes next is anecdotal at best. And, but the idea of like, what is the time frame between the two? Because I know for like, so some people I know, like there's four siblings and two that are older view their parents wildly different just because of the, the things that the parents were going through when the second set were, were around compared to the first. So like those formative years weren't tainted in the way, same way for the older pair as it was for the younger. Um, so it's really, I mean, surprise, Young Justice makes nuanced characters. <laughs> like, welcome, welcome to season four. They've done a couple of things with Emery that I feel like are setting up for some interesting stuff. Like, I didn't write this down, but we, me and Ariel, uh, Ariel Horn of Young Justice TV, and that you've probably, you've heard on our show as a guest, uh, we're talking about, like, she asked, like, why do you think Emery changed her name? And, like, I wrote this whole thing about how, like, it's, to me, clearly read as attempting to like lie about and hide the white Martian side of her family because like McGann's name is clearly known. McGann is a public figure at this point. And so Emery doesn't want to use her dad's name because it associates her with her sister who apparently is seen as like a pariah in their society at this point and with white Martians in general who are looked down upon and like that conversation her and McGann have really quickly when they fir- when she first shows up she the first thing she says is does dad know you changed her name she doesn't say do our parents know she says does dad know cuz that's the one she's that's the parent she's trying to ignore and pretend isn't a part of her life and her history and Emery's response i'm also now thinking is really interesting cuz she says oh of course he knows nothing phases dad dad doesn't care and i feel like that's a very like different viewpoint on that character than what McGann has probably seen of her father because her and her father have dealt with the same like prejudice from their society that Emery has no concept of on some level uh not no concept of but no experience with and yeah so Martian world building do you have any thoughts before I jump into all of the great things (laughs) It's so much and it was so good because it was, I mean, because there's always that fear that it's just like encyclopedic. Um, But then, you know, it was leveraged the framing device like Gar wanting to know all these things. The the one bit of world building that felt very much like an info dump was that moment where Gar goes, Mm -hmm. so I get this part of the cast system lists all the words, but I don't get this other part. And then they tell him and... So that one, like, even as I was watching it, that moment kind of made me laugh for a second because I was like, okay, good to know, good to know. But at the same time, like, I am willing to forgive that, like, moment of here's all the vocabulary because it is done quickly and through the framing device of Gar asking an actual question, but is clearly put there so that they can as quickly as possible go, here is everything you need to know. Now let us tell a cool story. And because it is only like two sentences, I am willing to just forgive it and move on since so much of the other world building is done through showing and showing us this complicated, interesting culture that they have also like hinted at and built up over time. So I am willing to let that one slide because it is it's it's the one little one that I was like, 
Okay, good to know. Now I have, I'll just write down all of the Martian uh, words for everybody and I'll understand what the sorcerer priesthood. Okay, got it. Got it. I got the important information that I will need this season. Thank you very much. Uh, And moving on. And moving on to the next bit. Uh, But just everything that they set up with the Martians and making Mars feel like a lived in, complicated, non Earth society is really interesting from the further explanation of the caste system that we've only seen like bits and pieces of filtered through what McGann has been willing to share with people to the concept that just everyone speaks telepathically. So you have to be careful. They're like, she's like, there's very little difference between thinking something and saying it. So like, be careful. Uh, (laughs) Just the way people are reacting things, the bits of culture and religion that we see are so cool. I, Loved the idea that people like shape shift into their favorite characters from TV all the time and everybody just yeah. kind of runs with it. Well, it's like, it's like, I mean, if you have that telepathic link and then you think of cosplaying and shape, it, it just like, well, yeah, that makes perfect sense. The, the other thing I think of is like, and probably the reason the tensions are so high is how much that turned on within the past year yeah. with them putting the satellite back up. Because you think about, I forget if it's just the generalized joke in sending things to Mars and it being so far behind. Um, like, oh, don't tell him who won the Super Bowl <laughs> of like 10 years ago. He's just now getting it. But the idea that like with it, it's real time. So like they know the outsiders, they yeah. know. But then again, like it's, it's that culture shock of just adding all of that in over the past year. And also like, and the idea that like even that bit of this culture was set up casually beforehand. Like there is the thing in season one where there's the <laughs> the scene of Superboy and Miss Martian getting caught on like security cameras with her pretending to be Black Canary and that whole situation mm. that we don't have time to unpack. Uh, but Martian Manhunter in that scene says something where he's like, this is a really common like game on Mars, basically. is like everybody knows who they're talking to. I'm sure Connor knew that it was McGann the entire time. And Dinah, of course, pointing out that that's not the problem. But like the fact that that is that seed was placed so early in season one for them to now in season four be able to go, everybody cosplays on Mars. And you go, okay. And like the way that it's kind of set up to me was that it's very clear that the younger generation of Mars cosplays and the older generations of Mars are kind of vaguely uncomfortable with that. Because even if it's like, well, I know who you are because we're telepathically linked, it's still not a thing that some people are okay with because they don't like the culture shock. Like you were saying, as we pan through the, the I, I came up with what, if I make a band, obviously I'm going to call it the glorious Godfrey's um, as the three of them were talking among amongst each other. Yes. Uh, that was amazing. I loved that. The whole group. That's the outsiders. Also whole group. That's the outsiders includes uh star girl who I don't think we've seen yet. Mm-hmm. So that's a little thing being put there as a nice thing but like with that moment when the kids who are all dressed up as the outsiders kind of rush up to them and are so excited i keep thinking about how there's a ton of dialogue in that scene very quickly and it's mostly everyone just being excited but there's one kid who says like something like i didn't realize i could be part of something bigger than myself until i saw the outsiders and like setting up that thing of like this is something that is inspiring people all the way on mars to do exactly the thing the outsiders were intended for and how that is clearly making a lot of people on mars very uncomfortable um which leads into all of the other stuff like the fact that i love the offhanded comment that murder is extremely uncommon on mars because everyone is telepathic. And I'm like, that Mm -hmm. makes perfect sense and tells me so much about your culture so quickly and is fascinating. (laughs) I love this idea that no one is equipped to figure out a murder because there hasn't been a murder on Mars in so long. Yeah, what do you do? do? How would you even, yeah, how would you hide? How would you hide? How would you keep it a secret from anyone? It's everything. Everything is, it's amazing. I found that super interesting. Little random side note when it comes to Martian culture. I had said this on our Discord, but for anyone else who might have missed it, because I missed it the first time through, 
when they're talking about and giving us that like description of like how the Martian sorcerer priesthood works, McGann's dad says that any Martian can become part of the sorcerer priesthood by shifting his, her, or their skin color to Yalone. And I just liked that little, little added pronoun there and wanted to call it out and say that that's cool. And someone else who is more equipped than me could probably do a very deep dive into like the complex concept of gender on Mars. And I would absolutely listen to it. And I kind of like, I kind of hope we see some more of that because this just made me smile. And it would be real cool if we got a little more, just more of that concept here on Mars. I know that there's like seven mysteries and an apocalypse coming, but like, it would be fun. (laughs) Yeah. And I also think about the process that is permanently shifting. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. Just, yeah, it was another rabbit hole where I'm like, I'm writing this outline. You don't have time to think about that. Move on. Because at a different time, but the idea of like, this is permanently. And what does that mean? And what? how does that work? And yeah, like, I think someone, it might have been on our Discord or it might have been on Twitter. I saw someone who was like, well, can't somebody just permanent, like, can't a white Martian just permanently shift their color to green and then they would get out of that? problem of the caste system or whatever and i'm like i feel like it's more complicated than that because i feel like if it wasn't more complicated than that we wouldn't the this problem wouldn't exist kind of thing you know what i mean but i feel like it's it's weird magic stuff and like i think it's my reading of it was it was some sort of like you have to believe that identity about yourself kind of thing if that makes any sense like yeah. The sorcerer priesthood, it feels like they shift to being alone because and experience and believe themselves to be that. Whereas like another Martian, like shifting their skin color to just exist in a different social class would know and believe themselves to not be. But that's a complicated concept that I'm not sure we yeah. have enough <laughs> knowledge to break down. I We're just falling down rabbit holes. Welcome to Young Justice yes. and welcome to Whelmed. It's what we do. But a little bit more about Martian world building because I have thoughts. The entire concept of everybody's telepathic and everyone just has a telepathic language and the ways that overlaps and everything is wonderful and interesting. I love that Ms. Martian's like, I've downloaded our language into your brain. <laughs> But just be careful about the etiquette thing. And I think it's really interesting to me that it's clear that Superboy is so much more at ease and quick to adapt to this concept than Garfield is. I think a lot of it is just like, I know Garfield's stressed. I know he's dealing with some stuff and we'll get into it. But like, I think a lot of it is just that Connor has been on a team with a telepath for way longer and has also been dating one. And just like I subscribe to that headcanon about the team that they just got really used to like using the telepathic link as like a group chat. Oh, yeah. Uh, So I feel like Connor is like, yeah, nothing is really different about this for me. I am good at and used to communicating telepathically with people. And Garfield is so much less comfortable with it because he was on the team for a shorter amount of time. And there isn't a telepath on the outsiders as far as we know yet. I thought that was an interesting touch. It's interesting. It's good. And I love how they represent the private psychic channels that people turn on by blurring the background and changing the audio mixing. Yeah. Cause it, so, so and it's so good. Cause the, the first time they do it, it's very clear and it's, they do it in such a way so that it's very clear so that when there's a moment later Later in that episode or into the second episode, I can't remember which one, where Superboy says to McGann, you think McCom killed the king, don't you? They do the same audio mixing, but it's so much subtler. And so you still you still understand like he has only said that to her. He has not said that to everyone else. He's only said that to her. But because they set up the first one as so clear, they're able to do it in all of the other scenes without saying it out loud basically and i love it it's such a good touch it's a good touch i love it i love everything also final bit of world building bio ship yes is here i love her i want it to be known that when bio ship flew off to go do whatever bio ship was going to do i out loud literally said does bio ship have bio ship friends only for her to fly into a cave surrounded by other ships and for me to shriek oh my god she has friends 
and then proceed to get very emotional as it appears Bioship went off and had an adorable baby Bioship. I don't know what's happening, but I'm hyped and it's cute. First off, that is officially referred to as the bio cavern. It makes me laugh. <laughs> yeah. Because it's I so forgot. good. I forgot that was the official title. <laughs> so, secondly, I am my head canon, as we like to call it here, is that Forager, McGann, and John all knew exactly what was happening. Mainly because of the way John awkwardly interrupts Connor whenever he wants to ask about it. And he's just like, we're going to talk about something else. Like, what do you mean? We're going to talk about something else now. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, my head canon is that they were all very aware. Um, and it seemed, very, I mean, such a, yeah, I mean, countless questions. Again, it was, it, we, we, I don't know that we can dive into them now, but just the idea that, yeah, going back into that group and it being like that group process is just awesome. Yeah. I want us to see more. I, I loved it. I was like that whole sequence of cutting back throughout the thing. I was like, I don't know what's happening, but I'm emotional for some reason. The music or the lighting. I'm just, I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but I hope everyone's okay. But also, I'm not sure if Forager knows, but I think it's very clear at this point that McGann absolutely knew like from the beginning. Oh, yeah. I think... It's one of those things where I'm like, I feel like McGann definitely knew because it's her bio ship and we have clear like dialogue of her being like, let's go see bio ship. I have a surprise for you guys. It's a good surprise. Come on. And everyone being like, what, the, what is happening? I like, I feel like John yep. might just like culturally know, like, <laughs> like it's just a way that like is probably happening, whatever, because Martian mm-hmm. culture, bio ship culture, who knows? I don't know. I'm excited, but <laughs> The we were I remember we were joking when these episodes first came out and we were all talking about them. I was like, this show successfully made a faceless, inhuman spaceship that can't talk an emotional creature that I care deeply about and got genuinely emotional during those scenes. Uh, and that's just kudos all around. I am excited and happy for for Bioship and new baby Bioship who. I shall be referring to as baby bioship until we are given a name or designation for this small creature. Yeah. I don't know what that would be just because we always call it bioship. Like I like I realized on a rewatch it's like I'm like everyone calls bioship bioship but there's seemingly other bio do they all, do they get do, are there other names? Is this like just yeah. the result of like the fact that the uh, Moore's Kent household has a wolf named Wolf and a sphere named Sphere and a bioship named Bioship. No one ever said they were creative with naming. So we're going to circle back to circle forward. Going off of the point that you had made about like Connor being more familiar, I think it's one of the things that is really setting Gar off in the scenario that he has now found yes. himself in. Um, because like you've undoubtedly read my note that I think a lot of this is – that he's on Mars is amping up the things that were already yeah. there and like turning it way, way up because you have all of this animosity built into the system that they are now in. And I think he's not able to control it because I, I mean, where does McGann's blood stop? Where does the meta gene start? What are we doing with the monkey? <laughs> so there's a lot of factors going on in the inside of Gar. Um, so I don't, I don't know where this has been. Put that put that whole sentence on a t-shirt. Yeah, I don't I don't know where this Venn diagram is meeting up, but um he is not pleased. No. And we will we'll get into some some theories and thoughts on what's up with Beast Boy when we get into crashing the mode. But like even just now, like they are setting up that Beast Boy is in a is in a bad way. He is stressed. He has multiple mentions of lack of sleep and not being able to sleep anywhere. Him and Perdita are clearly not doing great for vague reasons. And yeah, I don't know. I'm worried. I'm worried about our favorite Beast Boy. Yeah, I can't. I mean, the, like, even just being the team lead for the Outsider um, and getting that D1, D01 designation. But like I had completely forgot like, oh, yeah, but you're also Space Trek. You're, like you're the lead actor for like a syndicated show. <laughs> because he couldn't show. get out of his contract. Mm-hmm. But Yeah. Uh, some other things as we continue on, I, the conversation between McCom and McGann, like 
broke my heart in the best way possible. Like it is such a good, emotional, honest conversation between the two of them. Like, even though like later in the episode, McGann is like, you're just trying to distract me. And I think he is a little bit. It's also clear that like, these are feelings and struggles they have both had. And like the amount of just honest emotional honesty in that scene was so much like the two lines that caught me off guard and like I had to pause for a second because the show was moving very fast and I was like I need a minute to process it was like McGann saying I when he's like why why would you leave why would you leave and abandon me here and she says I had to go I was dying here and I believe her and that is a lot because like Season one has a lot going on and they tell us like McGann left because Mars was bad and we don't delve into that too much. But like just hearing her say that tells me a lot about how bad Mars was for McGann as a kid. And when McCom says, how could you abandon me? I was I was a child and you were my rock. And McGann's only response being I was a child, too. And how that was the moment I was like, I need to pause and breathe for a second. And just how that whole conversation in that scene parallels the conversation that McGann has with Harper in season three when they have her therapy session. So much of that, it's like the other side of the coin of that conversation because her talking to Harper in season three was like, you're a kid and you're trying to play be the rock between another kid and your and your abusive parent like you can't do that you are a child and like her saying that to harper and then having that reflected in how like mcgann has had to come to terms with like she feels guilty she clearly feels guilty for abandoning her brother but also she was a kid and she made choices because she was 16 (laughs) and she is a child and just all of that i am clearly babbling a little bit here but just because this scene was amazing and i don't know how to fully process all of my emotions surrounding that scene yet that's what scream somethings are for (laughs) yes so i think one of the big things with it is that it was and i don't mean this negatively i mean it positively is that it was a surprising tonal shift because we had for so long been told what that relationship would be and how they interact with each other And it's very aggressive most times and throwing you against a wall and getting tased a little and all of these things for it then to get so real so fast. It was like you said, it was just a lot to process in the best way. They're doing a very good job this season. I feel like at least so far of showing that McGann is clearly frustrated and angry at her brother for everything he has done, but she also still clearly their whole family still clearly loves Macom and doesn't want to see him doing this to himself and to other people. And they're just trying to process that complicated relationship. Wow. Young Justice doing complicated family relationships where people love each hey. other and also are like, you're doing awful things. Who would have guessed? <laughs> Gestures vaguely at Artemis and Cheshire for 10 years. Me. Yes. But Yes, a couple more things. There is a line in this. There are so many lines in these two episodes that are said so quickly and make me go, no, tell me everything right now kind of way. Where I know the show won't tell me everything immediately, but I'm absolutely fascinated. Where the royal advisor, whose name I am completely forgetting now because I forgot to write it down, but the Green Martian royal advisor, who is every royal advisor in any piece of media ever... <laughs> At one point uh, says about Prince Jem bringing in Connor and Beast Boy to help with the murder investigation. He's like, oh, this is just another of the prince's misguided modern notions, like his ill-conceived attempt at matrimony. And I immediately was like, who'd the prince try to marry? Why was it apparently a bad thing? What is happening? Tell me everything right now. Show me this. Show me this Martian. Tell me mm-hmm. everything I want to know. Are they going to be a character? Is this going to be a throwaway line? Are we going to get a whole subplot? Please tell me more right now. <laughs> uh, <green. laughs> Well, because I thought, like, is it a green or is he just breaking tradition and it was still red? Was it? I mean, okay. I was like, there are so many, like, my brain went in several directions from, like, is it 
a misguided modern notion because of caste system reasons, gender and sexuality reasons, or just something else I haven't even considered yet. Is it somebody from another planet? Like, I don't know. Like, it could be any of these things, and I would believe it and understand it for this show. But I'm excited. Tell me, tell me more, Young Justice. You gasped like you had a revelation. <laughs> so, why? Just that it was just the introduction of American television and it being like a super traditional uh, Earthway. <laughs> And people were like, no, garbage. Please don't do that. <laughs> that would that would be very silly, but like I hear you. Just like flashback to the other thing that I small thing I liked, McGann excitedly trying to be like, look at my engagement ring, and her wonderfully supportive but confused dad being like, I do not understand the significance of what you're trying to show me, but I'm gonna keep smiling. <laughs> yeah. You look excited. Yeah. <laughs> And Jan stepping in with the, like, if you watched more television, you'd know. <laughs> very, very cute on all fronts. Combine all of that with the added thing of McGann apparently asking Clark, Martha, and Jonathan uh, for their blessings to Mary Connor. I'm like, that is precious, and I am oh, so happy. Good. But no Lex Luthor. I'm sorry. All things go back to Super Martian Wedding. <laughs> Other couple more random little things from me. There is, we haven't talked at all about the Legion of Superheroes yet because I don't know what to say about them because I don't know anything about the Legion of Superheroes and the show hasn't told me anything either yet. So I am just running with these mysterious teenagers in the background uh, and what they're doing and what they're planning. I don't know. But there is a line said very quickly in the midst of everything else where I think it's Saturn Girl says like, we can't get too close to... Uh, Miss Martian and Superboy and Beast Boy again, because if we get too close, McGann will recognize my mind touch. And I'm like, do you mean that in terms of she has recognized you once already and she'll recognize you again? Or do you mean that in some larger, like, meta, she knows you, but wh why would she know? Who are you? I know you guys time travel. What is, I have questions. I have questions. I have questions about Young Justice. This is an entirely new development. So if we're making the assumption that the person in the diner is Saturn, oh. that means she's been here for a year. That's not to say that anyone else has or hasn't been, but that you were feet away from her at some point. And how many times did you proceed to do that again? Additionally, making the assumption that she is the one looking through the binoculars because she was watching them there. Where were Phantom Girl and Chameleon Boy? I don't know, but they all show up. Also, I'm making, I have to make assumptions because I don't know, but like, I think it's Chameleon Boy who's like posing as a green and like looks around from the corner with a Legion ring on. And at the house, when um, it's that cutscene of like the private message of Connor and McGann, Phantom Girl's like just like creepily half out of the floor looking at them as well. So I assume that that's like those are seeds of the three and then we see them in their full like suits later. I would agree, but we'll see. We'll see how that unfolds. There's a lot that these episodes set up that we have no more information about yet. But to get to the end, I love the little end credit scene thing that they're doing this season. It's just this it's using it's Young Justice using every inch of space that they have on the show to do interesting, compelling character things. And I like that these these moments feel like they're setting up an initial emotional seed to do more complicated narratives later, which I think is a very clever and smart way of approaching this. Like it gives us a moment to like place that seed of Halo wanting to explore and think more about Islam and what that would mean to, to her just because of everything else that's happened and things people even discussed when season three was coming out about how like Halo says in season three that she isn't Muslim, but is clearly wearing a hijab. And what does that mean for her and how does she want to approach that? And that whole scene was really touching and emotional and felt like it was approaching a complicated topic very carefully and I look forward to seeing where that goes and I also love the call from Perdita who is clearly struggling with some stuff and that 
scene was clearly meant to be like the emotional weight of her and Gar's relationship, but also sets up like that there is a refugee crisis happening in Markov and Vladova right now as and what that's going to mean for the season. And I love how this show is able to incorporate both those emotional character moments and the bigger world consequences and circumstances like the fact that black canary says like oh jefferson has put an emphasis on mental health for the league and that's the setup for the conversation with halo and i'm like that's awesome and that tells me something about this world right now and how perdita's thing is that she's just calling her boyfriend because she's sad but also is telling us like there are geopolitical economic (laughs) implications going on in the larger young justice world and it's doing both of these things at once, and it's amazing. I love it. Yeah. Well, yeah, like the idea that Gar and Perdita would have an easy relationship is just impossible. I mean, he's literally creating a a group of individuals that are having an interpl- interplanetary, at this point, I mean, it could yeah. be farther, effect. And she is dealing with her own crises and things like that. Also, Jefferson, that throwaway line, means that Jefferson still lives yeah. in the league, as far as, I, as, far as yeah. I'm concerned. So that made me so yeah. happy. Yes. yes. Go, Jeff. I am going to do my three final quick random things, and then we will move on to anything that you haven't said yet, because I'm sure you have lots more to say, and we just moved through our outlines here, guys. Random little things that didn't fit anywhere else. In Beast Boy swiping through all of his photos from the outsiders on his phone and being sad, there are a couple of characters that I think are new that I think people have pointed out. Like there's a redhead. There's like a magic redhead, it seems like, in one of them, maybe. I think somebody said was named Lila Briggs, but don't quote me on that. I'm not completely sure. But the one I am sure about is one of them has Wendy Jones from season three, who is the girl with wind powers mm-hmm. uh, and tornado powers, who teamed up, who is apparently at least sometimes working with the outsiders now. And that's cool. This is a quick way we're showing off new characters so we can have them later. There is an extremely quick throwaway line about how Ba'arza Um, the green beetle from season two, is going to take part in McGann and Connor's wedding. And that's fun. I just think that's cute. We have to build the altar together, son. <laughs> also, also, side note, Connor being very formal and a little bit nervous about interacting with McGann's dad is very cute. Because <laughs> he's just clearly, he like has only interacted with her parents a couple of times because they live on another planet and is just trying so hard <laughs> to make good impressions. And it's very sweet. <laughs> and they're clearly both like, it's, It's fine. Your family. It's okay. (laughs) Cute on all levels. And finally, last random thought from me. Uh, uh, Harper Rowe and her little brother have a stable, loving household now, and I'm very happy about it. And also, she definitely still has a crush on Halo. She has like three lines in this episode, and within the first two seconds, I was like, oh, you still have a crush on Halo? Okay. Let's let's explore this. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And our boy Lucas Carr got married. Good for you. And Lucas Carr got married. Snapper Carr got married to the police officer that I believe in season three is the one that like has uh, Harper and Halo in custody mm-hmm. when they get arrested yes. on the beach. I this we conserve all characters on Young Justice. Yes. Well, and, in, and she's from DC, and I think in the comics they got married. So here we are. Yes, I think I feel like I remember us in one of our episodes last season talking about that. Like, is that a thing? And it's a thing. Also, yeah. So then, like, we're jumping straight into my stuff. I, man, we're putting that we're putting that car house <laughs> down. We're we're just increasing the occupancy. See, <laughs> several it's a big form. house in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> it is. So I'm trying to think of things that I would want to mention that either aren't diving too deep or also aren't. Yeah. I don't want to dive too deep on certain things, so we can save. We'll save things for notes I put in later. Um, the big one is that um, Gar makes a detective <laughs> chimp reference um, as a really good detective, and it was just like super meta of just like monkey going back. Monkey King also detective chimp is like the second like smartest detective in all of DC. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Also, Connor hates monkeys. That's really funny to me. Like it was just like super. My brain went wild with that one. Also, a time skip inside the time skip was not lost on me. 
So we skipped ahead one year to immediately skip ahead another month. And we'll we'll see what happens with that. I could 100% see this show just going, don't worry about that month. It's fine. Or I could see this show being like, once we wrap up Mars, let's tell you about how a week, another week into February, everything went wrong on Earth. Like, I could see either of these things happening. Also, the other one that I found interesting was that Ma'al is used so many times in a very negative connotation to the point where I think, like, if we translated it to English, you would not be allowed to say that word. It just feels like that kind of thing. Uh, yes, I absolutely agree. I think, and it's also really cool, uh, along with that's another bit of really fun world building that they do with the Martians, but also just the way that they use language on Mars. I kept noticing like there is a different connotation between a Martian calling someone an earthling and them calling someone an earther. And those mean two different things clearly just based on the way people are saying them. And like, that's just fun. That's a fun, interesting way of using your, Martian language and your other culture language, your alien languages in a show like this. And it's just, it's real cool. I like it. It's, I'm excited. I'm excited for Martian world building. And I am both excited and dreading more names and proper nouns with 10 million apostrophes. Uh, There will be more, I'm sure. Hey, here's everyone at the wedding. (laughs) Just go down a list. (laughs) So that's about all I have for mine. Let's crash the mode. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that. We're all feeling the mode. (laughs) So in crashing the mode, we will be discussing potential storylines running through our heads based on the episodes that have been released at the time of recording. So this crashing the mode is based on episodes one and two of season four, as well as the trailer that was released during DC Fandom. So... I'm just. Do you want me to jump in, or you got stuff you want to share first? Well, I think your first one and my first one totally go together. So let's start with that. So this episode, the, one of these episodes, second episode, has Connor bleeding, and we get the whole explanation for how that's possible on Mars because he's underground and doesn't have as much sun. But it really feels like they're setting up for just some clear, higher stakes somewhere down the line later in this arc. It's some very clear planting and payoff for me, and I am worried, but I'm going to keep the worry at bay. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, so like how much do you infer out of the, the trailer is, is part of why we moved this to here. Yes. Because he ends up back on the surface during that, that dust storm in a breathing suit, which I can't figure out quite like, is it just because you're in that dust storm or is it because you can't breathe on Mars anymore because you're starting to lose your powers that much? Yeah. My two thoughts. Secondly, he does hug Gar and Gar's like, oh, I thought I I lost you. you." And that's part of why I'm trying to be not too worried. But also, I don't know if the trailer is trying to lie to us. It's possible. It also seemed like there might have been a couple of real quick clips in the trailer that looked like Superboy back on Earth. Like there's a scene of him punching somebody to a pulp that for whatever reason, like the the set behind him to me looks more Earth than Mars, at least quick seeing yeah. it. Yeah. So I'm just keeping yeah, all was, of my fingers crossed. It was crossed. nondescript enough. It was nondescript enough, but I'm keeping all fingers crossed that yes. this boy is okay. There is clearly, based on the trailers, we're getting more Cheshire this season. I know Ariel and I were very hyped about whatever's happening there with the hopeful when when harper crock family reunion 2021 please fingers crossed mm-hmm. please 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 uh and lots of league um so i was trying to, there was like league of shadows yeah and but then also the league of assassins so i think we are going to basically have double league work here because you have that split so you have lady shiva 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 and you also have um Rod. Raish, Roz, Raish, everyone, just say every version that you want. We all know who you're talking about. Um, the Al Ghul version. So I don't know what version we're even seeing yeah. there. Yeah. Because like it seems like nobody decided to buy a new outfit to wear. So it's confusing <laughs> in the trailer. Yeah. Uh, Cause people, Because people want Jason. And I do understand that they want Jason. But until I see Jason, 
or I hear Jason. Yeah. There is none. Yeah. I saw that note and I was like, was there Jason in this trailer? Like I had that, like that hadn't even entered my head. <laughs> yeah. So people, I think people are assuming that the person who unceremoniously broke the clipboard <laughs> is Jason because like the mask was really similar, but then the female ninjas that are fighting also have the same mask. So I think it's a sta- standard issue. We'll just have to we'll just have to wait and see on that one. Real quick, we said we were going to talk about uh Garfield. So Garfield is clearly going through some stuff. Um and there's a lot of stuff there. One of the things I noticed rewatching the trailer after watching these episodes when Garfield is, atta- is psychically attacked by the uh, other green Martians amidst all of the real fast clips of Martians and pain and whatever is a shot of Brion killing his uncle last season, which is a lot to unpack and watching rewatching the trailer. There is a real quick shot in there of like him curled up in like the vague mind space that young justice Mm -hmm. uses with this just encroaching wall of lava coming towards him. And I'm like, that feels connected. And also not great. Uh, yeah. Well, in the, in the same trailer, you also have that what seems to be that same mind palace in McGann being there with him. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I got, I got hopes. I got high hopes. I got hopes it's too. It's all going to work out. And like, I, there's been much discussion among people of like, is Beast Boy just dealing with PTSD, which I could believe is Beast Boy dealing with something else. Is there something bigger going on? Is he just stressed? What is this? And, Part of why my initial reaction isn't that it's like, quote unquote, just PTSD, unquote, is because this show has been so thoughtful about mental health and about therapy that part of me is like, I would be shocked if Garfield has not been in like ongoing helpful therapy since everything happened after season one, like. I would be genuinely shocked if that was not like high on the list of, oh, Garfield, you had a aggressively traumatic event and now you have come into this superhero world. We're just weekly sessions with Black Canary. And I I get that trauma is not linear and stress is not linear and he could be just having a really bad time right now. But part of me feels like there is something bigger and more. And if it is just that he's having PTSD and has not been able to get to resources recently because he is too busy, I would believe that too. I'm just worried that there may be other things adding on to whatever PTSD Beast Boy may have. The other thing that I wanted to mention is in the trailer, and we have nothing to go off of, but... Did we just get like another Lord of Chaos just cas- casually dropped? Because that's what I feel. The little the little girl at the very end of yeah. the trailer. I, uh-huh. It she has a vibe. She has that's, a vibe about her. Because people, because people. So I heard like or not heard. I saw some things that like oh is it Clarion? And I just don't think that's how this goes. Like I I, could, I don't. That just doesn't feel like something that would happen and i could be totally wrong and i'm totally okay with that but i just don't feel like oh we're gonna just casually drop this character at the very end of this trailer and it's just clarion (laughs) i just don't i don't accept this it's true yeah we'll see we'll see i think that based based on the wildly speculating and piecing together the sets from the trailer it looks like she is in the same general set as the stuff happening with Clarion and Zatanna and Zatanna's various magical prodigies where Mm -hmm. that whole staircase is covered in blood question mark raised eyebrow concern whole store whole Whole store store yeah Yeah. uh there's a lot we'll see how that goes but yeah that feels like another lord of chaos or some sort of not good thing we'll see what it is i'm not sure what it's going to be but she does not look friendly and speaking of people that don't look friendly or people that i don't believe at all so i don't think Desaad's telling the truth my fear is that it's not i mean it's just not going to do what he says i hear you i don't know what that means part of me also thinks like what if dark side was capable of using that not to alter them in a way that he could then control them because now you have an entire society of telepathically capable people that are under your control. 
Because look what they did. Like in those moments, like you're, sh- you're being shown the power that they have, especially when it starts to become a collective unit. Because you see that thousand voices when the queen is um, addressing the people. And what if he just, you know, had a whole planet he could point at someone? Yeah. It's not not looking good. The one final thing that I forgot to write down that I want to give a shout out to is there is a shot in the trailer of a very quick of a group photo of the whole team. And many of us, uh, at least myself, saw that and was like, when is this photo from kind of was like my ex- immediate mm-hmm. reaction and wonderful friend of the show, Ariel Horn did some digging of check cross referencing outfits and timing and stuff. And she is pretty sure that based on the outfits, everyone's wearing the background of that photo and the fact that Roy is there and smiling, Will, Will Harper is there and smiling. That photo was probably taken like 15 minutes before he joined the league uh, at the mm-hmm. very end of season one. And I absolutely believe her, absolutely agree with her. And uh just want to share that I think that's just a fun little touch. We'll see what we'll see what emotionally devastating scene that photo is connected to later. Dun, dun, dun. And with all that out of the way, I think we can Zeta out of the watchtower. So thank you for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. And if that somehow is not enough for you, you can email us at WhelmedPodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can always support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have a way harder time finding those. If you are able to support us monetarily and would like to do so, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours, under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.